We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Church, we are in our fourth week in this series called This Means War. What we're doing essentially is we're talking about some of the hot button issues of our day where we see a biblical worldview which seems to be at odds with the views of this world and the way our culture is constantly uh, waging war against some of the things that we hold dear that God's word says are true and, and real and complete. And so with that in mind, we've been talking through some of these things. And today, uh, we're going to kind of go a little uh, with a, a little bit of a hot button issue uh, where I, I want to be very careful to choose my words carefully. Uh, I want to not offend for the sake of offending people, uh, but with anybody walks out of here today feeling a little bit uh, offended, and it's, it's meant to be maybe the Holy Spirit maybe pointing something out to you. And so with all that in mind, let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. Uh, today's... Uh, title of my message is The War on Education. Now, you can probably already see where uh, a lot of people, uh, we have so many different uh, styles of education, perspectives of education in this very room. So let me, uh, let me just uh, make sure we all realize we're on level playing fields here in just, for just a moment, right? First of all, for show of hands, if we could get a little bit of house lights, that would be helpful. Um, there we go. How many of you uh, were publicly educated. You went to a public school. Wow. See, a lot of hands in this room, a lot of public education. How many of you went to a private school? You, you, your parents had money, all right? How many, <laughs> how many of you had, yep, yeah, okay. How many of you were homeschooled? How many homeschooled in there? Yeah, we got some. A, a lot of, I see a lot of younger hands. Uh, so how many adults homeschooled? Mike, I saw your hand up. Were you? All right. A couple, yeah, a few of you. That's awesome. Uh, and, and here, here, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I grew up in a public education. I was publicly educated from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, and I believe I turned out all right, okay? I guess that's for you, you all to, we, we can take a vote if you want. Um, <laughs> Uh, my dad was a public school educator for the first part of his career and then went into administration, was the assistant superintendent of a school district for, for many years before he passed away. Uh, my, my, my wife's parents, both of my in-laws were public school teachers before they retired just a couple of years ago. My wife was, uh, came through a, a private education system. She was in a Christian school her pretty much her whole uh, education until the uh, last two years of high school. She was in a, a public school. And uh, my wife and I, we homeschool our kids. So we kind of have a perspective, I would say, on all those different, we kind of have a little bit of an understanding of a public school system, of private school education, and home education. And there's a lot of different uh, views on all those subjects, even within this room right now. You could see where it'd be really easy for me to pick a fight, right? So let me say this right off the bat. I, my purpose of the message today is not to uh, rebuke anybody in this room for the education choice you have made. It is also not to try to highlight or set apart another education choice as the right one, because here's the deal. In this room, there's a lot of different, one thing we recognize, there's a lot of different families in this room, a lot of different socioeconomic statuses. Some of you maybe require two incomes and maybe you're a single family or you got, there's a lot of different situations going on right in here. There's also a lot of different schools, a lot of different teachers, a lot of different school boards all over this country, and some of them are different than others. So I want to make sure that we're really clear. I'm not trying to, to, to establish today that some of you have made a wrong choice, okay? Another thing I want to make sure I, I'm not saying, you know that I'm not saying today, is that this is not a, a, a rebuke of teachers. In fact, if you're in this room right now and you are a teacher, you're a, a, a teacher within our public education system, it might seem like you're, you're kind of you know, tightening up a little bit, ready to get punched or something. I want you to know, I think 
that if you're a follower of Jesus and you're a teacher in our public education system, you are like a missionary out on the field with your hands tied behind your back. And if anything, we should be yes. So now that you know what I'm not trying to say, let me tell you two what I would say bold statements that might, if if you're going to get offended, this is probably where it'll happen, okay? The first bold statement I want to make is this. I believe that there will be a time in the future when public education will no longer be a viable option. For some people, I believe in some places in this world, some places in this country, some school districts, some schools, you may have already passed that threshold. I have no idea what's going on where you have made decisions on how to educate your children. But there will be a moment in time where it's just so bad, it would be really, really foolish to have your kids in that system. And that's a decision. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Here's my next bold statement, is I believe that parents... I'm not going to apologize for this statement at all. I believe that parents, according to the Bible, are the ones who are primarily responsible for the education of their children. All right? According to Scripture in Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, direct your children onto the right path. It doesn't say direct other people's children. It also said, doesn't say have other people direct your children on the right. Now, listen, it's great. If you have other people, other children that you have an influence over, it's great for you to direct other people's kids onto the right path. It's also great to have other people in your kids' lives directing them onto the right path. Those are great things. But at the end of the day, the Bible says that it is your responsibility It is your responsibility to direct your children onto the right path. At the end of the day, you can't outsource that responsibility to anyone else. It's yours. Now, regardless of what education choices you make, there's a way to do that. If you you are sending your kids to a public school or sending them to a private school or choosing to homeschool, there's a way to do each of those and still be the primary provider of the education of your children and to make sure they're getting a true biblical education. We're going to talk about that. Remember a couple weeks ago, I talked about how I believe Satan's primary strategy in this war is to attack the family unit. By attacking the family, he can do incredible damage to individuals, to churches, to communities, because the family unit is like the the building block of of, of society. But if I were to pick a close second... What is Satan's number two close second strategy of really doing a lot of damage in this war? I would say that he's after the hearts of your children. He's after the hearts of our young people. In Proverbs 23, verse 7, it says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What's Going into and soaking in and what your kids are, are learning, what you're learning, the things that are in your heart, those are the things that are going to come out with your words, with your actions, with the choices you make, all the things that, that Satan knows. Listen, if I can get into the minds and hearts and, and worldviews of our children, boy, I can get them to do and say and give up their purpose in life and do all sorts of weird things for the rest of their life. I can cause a lot of damage. You know, there's these neurotransmitters that we all have called, they're called GABA transmitters. Will you say that with me? GABA transmitters. These GABA transmitters are these little, they're they're neurotransmitters that we have in our brains that help us in the process of learning, all right? And so let me tell you what a GABA transmitter does. What it does, when you get a new bit of information and your brain is locking this thing in and trying to learn this new thing. It's writing it somewhere. A GABA transmitter is a thing that kind of locks it into place and then moves the, the, the hard drive to the next bit of free information so you're ready to learn the next new thing. Do you know that children, the reason we say that children are like sponges, they learn so quickly. They, have you ever learned that? The older you get, the harder it is to learn new things. Well, there's actually truth that these GABA transmitters in young people, when they're in a process of learning, as their brain is is gathering new information, there's this influx of GABA transmitters that come out, and it allows them to gather new information and then move on to another information and move on to other information, and they're able to learn a ton of things all at once. 
And as you get older, these GABA transmitters, they actually decrease as you're learning. And so what happens is as you learn something new, you're able to still learn as an adult, right? You're able to grab something new. You're able to learn it. But instead of a GABA transmitter locking that thing in and moving things along, you end up replacing that thing you just learned with the next thing that you just learned. And before you know it, you're like, I learned, I think I was supposed to learn four points in Pastor Matt's sermon, but I only remember the last one. Because these GABA transmitters, they just kind of, they, they, we, we have a hard time uh, because we write over the thing we just learned with the new thing we just learned. We take a lot of time to learn. And our young people, they're like a sponge, Right? A sponge with liquid, you can pour like a ton of liquid onto a sponge and it quickly uh, absorbs it all, finds a place to hold all that. And it, it's like, that's what your kids' brains are like. Us old people, that we're like, we got uh, paper towels for brains, right? We can absorb some stuff, but uh, you put too much in there at once and it's all just going to come out, right? It's, it, you can't hang on to it. And so Satan understands the way your kids, our children, the way their minds work, and so as part of that strategy, he wants to go after them and pour as much uh, junk into them as, as possible when they're young, because like we just read, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Have you noticed there's some incredible shifts that are happening in our education system? I was telling you that I grew up in a public education system, public elementary school, middle school, high school. I think I turned out all right, but I'll also say I don't think the education system is the same as it was when I was in public school. I think a lot of things are shifting. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. You know, one of the things that's always bugged me in talking about education is this phrase that some people throw out, uh, this phrase called separation of church and state. Have you heard that before? A lot of people, when they use this phrase, they're going to use it in this way. They're going to say, well, there's this thing, and it's in the Constitution called separation of church and state. And, and the church isn't allowed to, uh, to put things into the public sphere, and that's, that's it right there. It's in the Constitution, separation of church and state. Well, do you know, I want to teach you something. Next time someone tells you that separation of church and state is in the Constitution, you ask them to show you where it's at, because it's not in there at all. That phrase doesn't exist in our Constitution. In fact, that phrase exists in a letter, a private letter, written by President at the time, Thomas Jefferson, to a community of people who were worried that the government was going to tell the church what to do. Not that the church was going to tell the government what to do. They said, listen, we're worried that when our pastor gets up to preach, that the government is going to come in like, in like in England and tell the pastor what he's allowed to say and what he's not allowed to say. And President Jefferson said, listen, I want you to know that there's now a separation between church and state, that that's not going to happen. In fact, he even puts in his letter to show you that the separation of church and state wasn't the other way around. He says, this is actually a right given to you as a church by God, he says in that letter. He uses the name of God in this letter. I want you to know this concept of separation of church and state, it was meant to keep the government out of the church, not the church out of the government. We've got it wrong. By the way, even if we allow that loose interpretation of separation of church and state. Let's just say we say, you know what? Separation of church and state, we shouldn't be teaching any Bible, any, uh, any biblical morality, a biblical worldview, a biblical view of creation. None of that belongs in our school because of the separation of church and state. Let's just assume for a moment that we, we adopt that view. I want you to understand that what that view is, is what we would call a biblical worldview that's based on an unprovable theory that we Christians, I can't prove to you without the shadow of a doubt, I can't use science to prove to you that, that God created everything. It's based on a, an element of faith. There's a theory there. And so a lot of people would say, that's a faith system, and you can't teach faith in schools. But then they'll say, but we are going to take this other faith system called naturalism, right? Where we believe that everything just came about by, by accident, that there was this explosion. There's this whole theory we got called the theory of evolution. We can't prove it, but we have enough faith to believe that this is kind of how things came about. We're going to teach this faith system and reject the other one. We're going to teach naturalism and reject supernatural anything. You see, in both cases, what's being taught in our schools 
is a system of faith. Whether it's a public school, private school, or home school, you are teaching your children some faith system. If you're like, we don't teach our kids any faith in our home. Well, you are teaching them a faith system that is also based on theory, that also can't be proven. You've also put all your eggs in, a, in another basket, right? And so we got this, this major shift where we see this, this concept of trying to remove any element of faith from the education system, while really what we're doing is we're putting another element of faith in. You know, in Harvard, uh, Harvard University, their founding documents, let me read this, this phrase to you. When they were founded, this was in their rules and precepts. It says, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. And therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Would we all agree that uh, things have shifted a little bit for Harvard that uh, if you look at the founding documents of pretty much most higher education systems, most Ivy Leagues, uh, most of the, the systems of, of even the public education system used to be founded on this kind of truth. That at the end of the day, the foundation of all knowledge has to be built upon the truth of God and his son, Jesus Christ. But things have shifted this concept of separation of church and state has caused us to, to, to try to, to, to pull all things that are true and good from God's word out of our education system. You see, if you really think about why we would call this a war, the war on education, what is at the heart of a war? Right? At the heart of a war is an insurmountable difference of opinion, of perspective, it might be an opinion on whose land is whose or, or what, uh, what rights should be rights and what rights shouldn't be rights or whether or not this is okay or not okay. But at the end of the day, there's some sort of insurmountable difference of opinion. And, and, and because it's insurmountable, you end up having two sides and you got to pick one. And there's a war going on. Well, I will argue that in our understanding of what education looks like, there's such an insurmountable difference between our world's perspective on education and a biblical perspective on education that there's a war going on. And we have to determine how we're going to fight, how we're going to be in this war. So let me compare and contrast where I think we disagree the most. And I'm giving you all three fill in the blanks right now if you want to get ahead. I think we disagree on the purpose of education. I think we disagree on the strategy of education. And we disagree on the content of education. So let's talk about those three things uh, we're going to separate those out and compare and contrast. The first one is I believe that we have a major disagreement on the purpose of education. All right, let me uh, read to you real quick the mission statement of Anne Arundel County Public Schools. All right, I went right to their website. All right, this might feel like here he goes, picking fun at public schools. Uh, this isn't that bad. Let me, let me read it to you. Anne Arundel County says it is the mission of Anne Arundel County Public Schools to nurture and educate all of our students to be well prepared for community engagement, career entry, and college, ultimately empowering them to create a better quality of life for themselves, their communities, and the next generation. I think we could all hear something like that and say, that doesn't sound that bad. Like, there's nothing wrong with wanting a better quality of life or to, to help people prepare for what's next, or to, the, not just a quality of life for themselves, but a quality of life for their community and for their future. Like, that sounds like a pretty, at, at first glance, that doesn't sound like there's much of a problem here, but there's something major missing in this that I want to explore with you. And you know, one of the first things that bugs me about it is this concept of quality of life. And let me explain that before any of you are like, wait, are you saying we're not allowed to have a quality of life? No, I'm not saying that. Let me, th this concept of a quality of life, what, what it makes me think of right away is this concept of the American dream. 
There's a, a generation, I know my, my parents' generation, and there, if you were to ask my parents, what is the goal of education? Like, what are you hoping for for your kids? And they're like, well, I want them to be able to get good grades so they can get into a good college. And then from a good college career, they'll be able to get a good uh, career and get a good income. And then they'll be able to get married and they'll have uh, uh, two and a half kids or whatever that average is. That's weird, right? And they'll have uh, a house with a white picket fence and two two cars, or essentially they probably would have said, we want them to have a better life than we had. We want them to have a a quality of life that's better than the quality of life that we have. This concept of the American dream, I want to argue that you're not going to find this concept of what your purpose is in life or what the purpose of your children's life, you're not going to find that in this book. God didn't put you on this planet to just pursue a great career with a high income so you can buy great things and have more than your parents had. Now, there's nothing wrong at, at face value with a high quality of life, of, of wanting to, to be able to have some nice things. At face value, there's nothing wrong with that. But the truth is missing is that the, in order to have a true quality of life, You don't have access to true quality of life absent of faith in God. The true abundant life comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And so if you really want people to have a quality of life, you can't separate it from faith because you can't have a quality of life, a true quality of life apart from faith. It says in Proverbs 16, verse 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver? You see, that was my other problem with the Anne Arundel County mission statement is that it's void of faith. I know what some of you are saying right now. You're thinking, well, it can't have faith worked in there because of separation of church and state. We just talked about that, all right? Let's think about this for a moment. Where does education start according to Scripture? What is the, the foundation of education? Harvard had this right in 1630. It says this in Proverbs 1, verse 7, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. Will you say that with me? Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. I love how uh, this, this word true knowledge, it's not just knowledge, but in order, you can have all sorts of knowledge, but if you want to have true knowledge, it's going to be built upon the foundation of faith, of fear in the Lord. And the reason why is that Everything you learn, everything we're meant to learn is meant to be seen and understood and experienced through the prism that God created it for us to live in and experience and learn about. Let me give you some examples in math. One of the the things we can learn, we're not just learning that two plus two equals four. We're learning that our God is a God of order. In physics, we're not just learning about laws of the universe. We're learning about the laws that God gave to hold everything together. A supernatural force provided these laws to keep us from spiraling spiraling out into wherever. In history, we're studying how we got here from God's creation. We're studying the, the beginning of the known natural timeline to where we are right now. That's what history is about. In art, in in literature. In music, we're really using the creativity that God gave us as a creative God. He created everything. He's very creative. He made you in his image. We get to be creative like he's creative. And when we understand art and literature and music from that perspective, it changes the way our education develops. You see, reading and writing and arithmetic, they are important things. But the purpose of education is far more holistic than that. Let me read one of my favorite quotes on education. It's from a missionary in India named Amy Carmichael. And she says this, The purpose of the children's education is not the passing of examinations, but the training of spirit, mind, and body for the service of the King of Kings. To this purpose, all else must be subordinated. See, the purpose of education, I think we, we disagree a lot 
as a, with a biblical worldview between the world's perspective and a biblical perspective, I would say that the purpose of education, there's a huge difference in that I believe that education starts on the foundation of faith. In order to have that quality of life that Anne Arundel County Public Schools wants your children to have, it's got to be built upon a foundation of faith. Now, I could go off a little bit. Uh, there's, a, there's a skeptic in me that could go a, another hour on this point alone and tell you that I think there's something a lot darker going on in the higher levels of education. I'm not blaming any individual teacher or school or, or school board or whatever, but there's something, it might even just be supernatural, that Satan knows how vulnerable your children are. And so I think there's something going on at a higher level that's much darker, that when I talk about the purpose of education, I think that sometimes the purpose, I wrote down a couple things. One, I think there's an intentional teaching right now within the world's education system. This can happen in a public school, in a private school, or in a home school, where in some cases there's an intentional teaching of reliance on the government, which is a form of slavery, instead of a reliance on God, which is the ultimate form of freedom. We need to make sure we're paying attention to what our children are learning. Here's another thing I wrote down, is I think that in a lot of cases I see that our children are actually being taught not to think for themselves, but to let other people do the thinking for them. And that's scary, because that's not a biblical education. All right, here's the second thing. Compare and contrast not just the purpose of education, but the strategy of education. How do we strategically educate a young mind? Or uh, for, for you who are, we're all supposed to be learners our whole life. So how do we strategically learn in a way that is God honoring? If you think about the world's system of education, at least what happens in most uh, public, private, and maybe even homeschool settings, unfortunately, a lot of, the, what's the most precious commodity that's used up in our education system? Time. Think about this. 40% of young people's lives are used up just like that with sleeping. 40% gone, all right? You got 60% less, or left. 60% left. 31% of that time is used on average in education. Uh, it's used in class time, about 26%, another 5% used in homework or tutoring or something else that's geared towards the education. So that's the, that's the second biggest chunk is education, all that time. And for often for many of us, when we look at actually what's happening during that time, the system is geared towards uh, spending a whole lot of time cramming information into children for the purpose of a standardized test. We got to get kids to pass these tests. Oftentimes also what you see is the classroom sizes are such and that the, the education level is geared towards the lowest common denominator in the room, right? No kid left behind. And so an incredible amount of time is used up as part of the strategy of the world's education. And we got to recognize that Satan knows what he's doing. Thinking about this, this strategy, let me compare it to what I think is a biblical strategy for education. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 17, it says this. It says, God gave these four young men. Now, who are these four young men? In context, we got Daniel as one of these young men. We got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Daniel and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it says, God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. Don't miss that right there. It says he gave them an unusual aptitude for this gaining of knowledge, but also wisdom. There's this other thing that's, that's mentioned separated from this learning, this thing called wisdom. It says God gave Daniel this special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. So what we can tell from this verse right here, just using some logic, right, is that wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge, right? This concept of education, it's not just the gathering of facts. It's not just the gathering of knowledge. There's something else that, that needs to be included. It says in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6, for the Lord 
grants wisdom. Let's pause right there. I want to know what wisdom is. How many of you want to be men and women who use wisdom in your life? I want wisdom, right? So if I want wisdom, I got to know and ask myself, if the Lord grants it, he's the one who gives it, how do I, how, what is it? How do I get some of this from God? What, what, is, what is the makeup of wisdom? And then we get this next part of the verse. It says, from his mouth come this wisdom, right? It says right there, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding, smash those two things together, and guess what you got? You got wisdom. It's a recipe right there for wisdom. You see, in a public education, in a private education, or in a homeschool education, where you have a focus on just pouring knowledge into young minds, you're missing a whole part of the strategy of education. Education's not just supposed to be based on knowledge. It's meant to also have this element of of wisdom. And let's talk about this wisdom of, of understanding, knowledge and understanding. You see, wisdom is a combination of knowledge and understanding. It's knowing what is true. That's the knowledge part. But then it's also knowing what to do with what you know is true, how to apply it to your life, how to logically and reasonably figure out what that information is meant to do for you and for the people around you. That is called wisdom. Gathering of information, knowing how to apply it, knowledge and understanding equals wisdom. See, I would argue that the world's strategy for educating our children is built upon just the outpouring of, remember this, learn this fact, add this to your brain. A bunch of pouring in of of facts, and a lot of times the facts aren't even facts. They aren't even real things. But a biblical perspective on education is not just learning of facts. It's learning how to think. It's learning how to learn You see the difference there? It's learning how to learn. It's learning how to think for yourself. It's learning how to understand and apply what knowledge you've acquired. You see, a biblical education has a strategy that is tied to wisdom. And oftentimes as well, what I will add to this is that a biblical strategy of education includes mentorship. It includes using other believers, part of the body of Christ, to come alongside and and help encourage people in their faith. It also includes an application of faith and action, of taking what you've learned and applying it to bring glory to God. With this in mind, I think we can agree that there's a huge disconnect in our strategy of education. Number three, we're going to compare and contrast the content of education. Now here's, here's an interesting element here. You see, a true biblical education is going to always be connected to the truth. If you want your kids to have a true education, you want them to know what's true and not what's lies, right? You want to send them to a place where someone's going to pour real things into them and not lie to them. And if, man, I I could go another hour just making a list of all the things that are sometimes taught in different education decisions we make for our kids. You can send your kids to certain places and there's things being taught that aren't even reasonable or logical anymore. There, you know, you could go to a biology class where just 30 years ago, we've always understood that there are men and there are women. And now the whole public education, sometimes private education, sometimes homeschool education, where people are pouring into our young people something that is nonsense, that somehow there's, you know, multiple thousands of genders or something. You know, there's, there's stuff being taught in our schools that's so weird. I, I read a whole article once. Did you know that sometimes we've always thought that two plus two equals four? I always thought that. You know now that making a declarative statement like that about math, there being a right answer is a microaggression and somehow racist these days? Like what in the world? Some of the things that are being taught as the content of the education in, in every school choice, some of it is just so far-fetched, it's so far away from truth that we ought to question, like, why, what were we allowing to be poured in to our children? 
You see, a, a true education, if you really look at these three things up on the screen here, a true education is, is tied to faith, it's tied to wisdom, and it's tied to truth. And oftentimes, we need to make sure, every time, we need to make sure as parents, that as our children are being educated, that we make sure that whatever strategy we are deciding on, whatever strategy we're using, that there is a commitment to making sure that our kids' education is full of faith, it's full of wisdom, and it's full of truth. Otherwise, according to God's word, it's not the education that God has designed for them. So far, what now, God, this morning? I want to challenge you with a couple of recaps. I want to remind you of a couple things. And then I want to share with you what Pastor John Piper says are four things that must be present in your children's education for you to know they're getting a Christian education. So here's a couple of recaps real quick. Number one, education is important. Education for your children is such an important thing. You can't uh, just decide that it's this insignificant thing that just takes up 30, you know, almost 40% of their, their life. It's very important. The second thing I want you to remember is that it must be built upon the foundation of faith. You need to make sure that whatever is being taught, it is being taught with an understanding that there is a God who created all things and he sent his son, he sent Jesus, the understanding that Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection, the significance of that and how we interact with the world and with others. In order for there to be a true abundance of life, we ha- it comes through that truth. Another thing I wanna make sure we don't miss, parents, this is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to make sure this happens for your children. No one else's. I'm going to repeat again. A real education goes beyond knowledge. It includes faith. It includes wisdom. And it includes truth. It's got to be based on faith. It's got to be, uh, have a strategy of wisdom. And what we teach has to be true. Proverbs 9, 9 says this. Instruct the wise and they will be ever or even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. With that in mind, let me share with you these four things that Pastor John Piper communicated in a message. I thought they were so good. I didn't want to change them at all. I'm just going to tell you what he says. If you want to make sure that your kids are getting a Christian education, whether you choose private schooling, you choose public schooling, or you choose homeschooling, we all got to answer these questions. We want to make sure our kids are getting these four things. Number one, we want to educate them with a reliance upon the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit says, teach this, or focus on this, or ask about this, or do this, or, or whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do as a parent, do it. Because the Holy Spirit needs to be one directing you in this process of providing a Christian education for your children. This, even the question of how should we be educating our children? Should we be in a private school? Should we be homeschooling? Should we be in a public school? As you ask that question, rely on the Holy Spirit to guide you and do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. The second thing is this. Make Jesus the foundation of all teaching. Make sure the the truth about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that that element of the, the core truth of the gospel is worked into your strategy of educating your children. Because I promise you, if they, if they turn 18 and they're like, all right, I got all the education I need, but nobody ever told them the truth of the gospel, you missed an incredible hour. It's not too late, hopefully, but you missed an incredible opportunity right in there. Number three, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever you teach, I want to make sure you know you're you're not teaching for the sake of them having that house with the white picket fence. You're not teaching your kids so they can be successful and have more than you had. You're not teaching them so they can go to a great college. Listen, I don't know what God has planned for your kid, but college might not be part of the plan. 
It might not be to have a big house with a white picket fence. He might send them to some other corner of the world where they're going to have a really tough life financially, but boy, are they going to be blessed because God's in it. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And the fourth thing is this. Make sure you educate your children governed by the authority of the Bible. If the Bible says it's true, let's make sure our kids know it's true. If the world says something is true and the Bible says that it's false, let's make sure we always err on the side of knowing that we're going to educate governed by the authority of this book right here. Let me say this. Um, I wanted to be intentional about not picking on uh, public schooling or private schooling or homeschooling. I'm not playing favorites this morning. I understand every situation is different. But I do want to say that whatever choice you make, you are the one responsible for making sure that these four things are happening. And if you have any questions, maybe God's prompting you to consider a homeschooling option. We're providing a a growth course on June 2nd where we have homeschool parents and families who are gonna answer some of those tough questions that you have. Wondering, is this really even possible? Can I afford to do this? Do I even know what I'm doing? If you have questions like that that you'd like answered, I wanna invite you to register for that growth course on June 2nd. We'll answer those questions for you. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us, uh, that you give us every Sunday to open it up and to use it as your revelation of truth. You provided us more information about who you are and who we are in light of who you are. And in doing so, Father, we get to see what's true about us. We get to see what's true about the style and form of education you have planned for our children, that you have planned for us. We recognize that a a true education is going to be based on faith. It's going to have a strategy of wisdom, of not just gaining knowledge, but knowing how to apply that how to learn and logically reason through things and to think for ourselves. And at the end of the day, we also recognize that it's all based on this this concept, God, that you've given to us, that it's all based on truth. And so we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to educate our children. Help us to do it the way you would have us to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.